everybody welcome back in today's video we are going to talk about nutrition in plants and animals now nutrition is defined as the mode of taking in of food by an organism and its utilization by its body now we might ask that why do we need to take in this food anyways food is essential because it is a source of energy to carry out all the biological activities in our bodies inside our cells at any point of time there is a vast array of biochemical reactions that requires energy to run the energy is going to be provided by the food we eat food contains nutrients like carbohydrates fats proteins vitamins and minerals each of which have their specific functions for example the bonds in carbohydrates and fatty molecules are going to contain chemical energy and when these bonds are going to be broken this energy is going to be released then this energy is going to be trapped in the bonds of a molecule known as ATP. So ATP or adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency of the cell. Just like in everyday day-to-day -day life, we require money currency that is the paper currency for the monetary exchanges. Just like that, ATP is used for all the energy which is required for running the biochemical reactions. In the bonds of ATP, the chemical energy of the nutrients is stored and whenever we need to provide energy for any reaction to take place, the ATP would be broken down and this energy would be released and that would help us to fuel or run the reaction. Apart from that, apart from carbohydrates, fats are also used to degenerate ATP. Proteins are very important because they serve as building blocks and they are going to make a lot of different kinds of structures in our cells which perform different functions. For example, you might know about enzymes and enzymes are biological catalysts. From chemistry, you might recall that a catalyst is a substance that helps a reaction to occur without itself getting used up in the reaction. And most of the enzymes in our body are proteinaceous in nature. Vitamins and minerals are those parts of our, our diet, which even though they are required in lesser amounts, however, they are very crucial for the proper functioning of our bodies. For example, vitamin A is present in spinach and carrots and it is responsible for proper vision. Its deficiency can lead to a condition called as night blindness. Similarly, the common salt or table salt contains sodium which is very important for the brain to relay messages to all different parts of the body. Now that we know why we need food, let's try to look at different types of nutrition. Nutrition can be divided into two types based upon whether the organism can synthesize its own food or not. Autotrophic organisms are those organisms which can synthesize their food using certain raw materials which are present in their environment. Autotrophs would require energy to synthesize their own food. An analogy would be you cooking your favorite dish in the kitchen. For example, you want to cook noodles. Now, if you take noodles and water and keep it in a pan, then would the noodles cook by themselves? The answer is no. You would need to turn on the gas because that heat energy is going to be the one thing that cooks the food. Similarly, autotrophs are going to require a source of energy so that they can cook their own food. Now this source of energy can be, uh, basically there can be two sources of this energy. One source is light energy and those organisms which are going to use light energy in order to synthesize their own food are known as photoautotrophic organisms. There is also another source of energy that organisms can use and that is chemical substances. Basically, the bonds in the chemical molecules, they bear the energy and when these bonds will be broken down, the energy would be released and that energy would be used to synthesize the food. Such organisms are known as chemoautotrophic organisms or chemoautotrophs. So basically, autotrophic nutrition can be photoautotrophic or chemoautotrophic depending upon what is the source of energy which is being used to synthesize the food. Heterotrophic nutrition is the other type of nutrition in which the organism cannot synthesize its own food and therefore it has to depend on other living organisms to get its food. Once it has got its food then it is going to break down the food or basically utilize it in one way or the other so as to derive energy from it. Now all heterotrophs are thus ultimately dependent on autotrophs for their nutrition. 
and we know that animals can be herbivorous carnivorous or omnivorous depending upon what they are eating herbivorous animals eat uh, they directly feed on plants for example deer cow carnivorous animals feed on the flesh of other animals for example lion now there are also carnivorous plants for example venus flytrap and pitcher plant you might recall that these plants feed on insects why do they feed on insects because they need to synthesize proteins and proteins have a very important requirement that is of nitrogen basically nitrogen is an important constituent of proteins and even though there is abundant atmospheric nitrogen around us the plants are not able to use this atmospheric nitrogen because it is a very inert molecule and thus they have to rely on forms on nitrogenous forms which are present in the soil now what would happen if the soil around the plant is deficient in nitrogen then the plant would have to look on for other ways by which it can take in nitrogen so as to synthesize its own proteins venus flytrap and pitcher plant thus have modifications in their structures by which they are able to capture and then digest or break down insects in order to get nitrogen and other nutrients and from this nitrogen they are going to make their proteins other than that they do make their own food they do make their own carbohydrates fats etc omnivorous organisms are those organisms which can feed directly on plants or on the flesh of animals for example bear humans and also crows now now let's also look at the different types of heterotrophic nutrition and at this level you must know about these three types which are holozoic saprotrophic and parasitic mode of heterotrophic nutrition in holozoic mode of nutrition which is the one which is also found in us in human beings there are five steps in order to derive nutrients once the organism has taken in the food then that food is going to be undergoing five different steps and ultimately those steps are required to derive nutrients out of the food then the nutrients are going to be utilized in order to derive energy apart from animals amoeba and paramecium and other unicellular microorganisms they are also dependent on holozoic mode of heterotrophic nutrition saprotrophic nutrition is shown by fungi like mushroom bran mold and yeast and in this particular type of nutrition the organism absorbs nutrients directly from dead and decaying organic matter everything that lives on this earth dies and once an organism dies its body decomposes what fungi do is that they grow on this dead body and they secrete digestive juices on the body directly what do these digestive juices do they break down the complex food particles into simpler ones and ultimately breaking down them down at the level of nutrients nutrients are then directly absorbed from this dead and decaying organic matter the third type of heterotrophic nutrition is the parasitic mode of nutrition in which we have a parasite which is dependent completely on the host organism for its nutrition what is the host organism the host organism is that particular organism on the surface of which or inside the body of which the, uh, the parasite is going to live and derive its nutrition from so basically the host is going to carry out its nutrition in whatever way it does for example if it is a plant then it is going to show autotrophic nutrition if it is an animal and it shows holozoic mode of nutrition then it is going to perform all the steps but as soon as the nutrients are produced by the host or in other words the nutrients are obtained by the host that particular parasite is going to take those nutrients from the host and in this way it deprives the host from the nutrients now even though a parasite requires the host organism to be alive in order to be living itself because imagine if the host is dead then it would not be able to take in food or it would not be able to utilize it to derive nutrients and if it is not able to get nutrients then it, the parasite won't be able to take the nutrients from the host and therefore a parasite needs its host organism to be alive in order for itself to be alive if the host dies the parasite is also going to die however in most of these situations when a parasite affects a host organism it causes parasitic infections because think of it if you are depriving someone of the nutrients then they, it is going to cause one or other disease in that particular organism and that can ultimately 
in the most severe cases even lead to death. Examples of parasites are leeches, ticks, mites, bedbugs, even mosquito is a parasite because it absorbs blood and inside blood there are nutrients. There are also parasitic plants like amabel which grows on trees. It's a parasitic plant so it does not show any autotrophic nutrition and it deprives the trees that it grows on from nutrients. Now parasites are different from predators. Predators kill their prey organism before feeding on them whereas parasites do not kill their host organisms. They live inside a living host and they, de they derive nutrients from this living host. Now that we know about the heterotrophic nutrition, let's look at the mechanism by which plants synthesize their own food. And in this particular category or in this particular situation, we are talking about carbohydrates, synthesis of carbohydrates by the plant, which takes place by the process of photosynthesis. We are talking about green plants and certain unicellular bacteria like cyanobacteria, which are going to utilize light energy in order to synthesize their food. And recall just a minute ago, I told you that if the autotroph is going to utilize light energy for synthesis of its own food, then that organism is going to be called as a photoautotroph. Therefore, green plants and cyanobacteria are photoautotrophic organisms. The source of energy for synthesis of this food is sun. To be more correct, the source of energy is actually white light. The sun is the major source of white light and therefore almost every plant that lives on this planet is dependent on sun for its energy. Apart from and, and also because it is the plants which are making food for all the other heterotrophic organisms directly or indirectly, therefore we say that sun is the ultimate source of energy on this planet. Now the next question is how do plants trap the sun energy? How do they trap the light energy? They trap this energy by using a green pigment which is present in their leaves called as chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is present in the chloroplasts which is a special type of cell organelle present in the leaves of the plants. This chlorophyll is the one which is trapping this light energy. Now also know that it is not just chlorophyll but there are different pigments. There are red, green, yellow pigments all of them are responsible for absorbing light energy. But because most plants have abundant chlorophyll, that is why they appear green in color. Now once plants have absorbed this light energy, they are going to convert it into chemical energy. And this chemical energy would be used to break down one of the raw materials that is water into hydrogen and oxygen. The raw materials for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide, and water and as we have seen that the light energy that has been trapped using chlorophyll is going to be converted into chemical energy that is going to be used to split or break down the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen finally carbon dioxide is reduced to glucose reduction is that process by which you either add a hydrogen molecule or remove oxygen molecule from a compound or a molecule or you transfer electrons to that particular molecule. So in this particular case, CO2 is being reduced to glucose, which has the formula C6, H12, O6. And as you can see that you have reduced glucose, you have added on hydrogen molecules. And therefore, we say that CO2 has now been reduced to glucose, which is the carbohydrate that has been synthesized by the plants. Let us also look at the overall equation of photosynthesis. We can say that the plant have used CO2 and water as their raw materials in the presence of light and chlorophyll to synthesize glucose. And as you can see here, in this process, oxygen has been produced as a byproduct. This oxygen is also released by the plants, and this is the same oxygen that all of us breathe, and it will be utilized in a process called respiration. You can also notice over here that water is also a product in the chemical reaction. However, for every 12 water molecules that have been used, 6 water molecules are produced. Therefore, we can say that overall water is utilized in photosynthesis and the byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen which is released by the plants.
now because plants can use light energy to produce their food this light energy can come from natural sources like sun or it can come from artificial resources or artificial sources like tube light and bulb also basically plants are dependent on white light they can capture different parts of the white light which is at this level not very significant but you are going to learn about in higher classes that plants can capture different parts of this white light using different pigments that are present in them and because the entire process of photosynthesis is occurring in the leaves of the plants therefore leaves of the plants are also known as the kitchen of the plants now the carbohydrates that have been produced are utilized in order to provide energy however all the carbohydrates that are not being used at the moment and their excess would be stored as a reserve food material called as starch and starch would be used by the plant when it is not performing photosynthesis starch is also tested by the iodine test in which star in the presence of iodine starch turns blue black starch is actually a polymer of glucose polymers are consisting of repeating units of a monomer so basically as you can see over here that this is starch and starch can exist in two forms amylose and amylopectin and each of these structures as you can see each of them refer to a, mo a monomer or refer to a glucose unit so each one of them is a glucose and they are uh, they are connected together they are attached together they are bonded together in order to form these structures in amylose there is only a single a uh, straight chain but in amylopectin there is a branching you can see that over here there is a branch over here there is a branch this is a branch and you can see all of these branches that are arising from this main chain of glucose units in animals this reserve food material this reserve form of carbohydrates is glycogen and glycogen is also a polymer of glucose in fact it resembles amylopectin however as you can see it is much more branched in comparison to amylopectin so remember starch and glycogen are storage form of carbohydrates in plants and animals respectively now the next question that arises is that how do plants take in the carbon dioxide carbon dioxide which is one of the raw materials is actually taken through is taken inside the plant through stomata stomata are tiny pores which are present on the surface of the leaves and through them the gaseous exchange is going to take place which means that not only carbon dioxide is going to enter plants through the stomata but also the oxygen which is produced as a byproduct of the photosynthesis reaction is going to leave through the stomata and stomata are present in the epidermis so over here you can see that in this picture they have shown a portion of leaf as magnified and in the epidermis they, this particular structure denotes the stomatal apparatus over here this pore like structure is stomata which is surrounded by these two cells which denote the guard cells guard cells which surround the stomata literally guard the opening and closing of stomata and now you might ask that why do we need to open or close or why do we need to regulate this opening and closing of stomata well the reason behind that is because stomata is not only serving for gaseous exchange but it also serves as for transpiration it is also by which the water is lost from the surface of leaves this process called transpiration is very important because it creates a suction pull that will help the roots to absorb water from the soil now what if the environment or what if the surroundings have high amounts of water in that particular situation the plant can afford losing water and therefore in this particular situation water is going to flow inside these guard cells and as it flows inside these guard cells they are going to swell up once they swell up because of their shape and because of their orientation this stomatal pore opens and through this stomatal pore opening the gas is exchanged as well as transpiration can occur however if there is deficiency of water or there is less amount of water in the surroundings then the plant cannot afford to lose water plant needs to save this water and therefore as the water moves out of these the guard cells the stomatal aperture is going to close and because of that the stomata is going to close as the stomata closes it is going to limit the water loss by transpiration 
but it also affects the gaseous exchange. However, gaseous exchange takes place not just through the leaves, but also through other parts of the plants. It can take place through stem, it can take place through roots. There are specific openings in the structures which allow gaseous exchange to occur. Now you might also know that in the desert plants, they are adapted in order to prevent water loss by transpiration, that their leaves are needle shaped and the function of photosynthesis is taken over or performed by the stem. Next, let's look at how does water reach the plants. As we have said that water is absorbed using the roots. Along with the roots, the minerals are also absorbed from the soil. And then this water travels up in the plant and reaches the kitchen of the plant that is the leaves and all other parts through the xylem. Xylem is a part of vascular bundle which is going to be responsible for transport of water and minerals. You might also recall that the other part is phloem and phloem is responsible for the movement of food which is synthesized in the leaves to all different parts of the plant. Now as we can see that once water has traveled up it would be lost from the leaves by the stomatal openings through transpiration. Now I've already mentioned that proteins are synthesized by plants and they utilize nitrogen for it. And I've also mentioned that plants cannot utilize the nitrogen directly from air because this is a very inert molecule. Instead, they are, they are using nitrogen which is present in the soil, usable forms of nitrogen which are present in the soil in order to synthesize proteins. They're going to absorb this nitrogen along with water and this is how they make their own proteins. Now there are certain bacteria in the soil that are going to help them fix, literally fix nitrogen that is converted into usable organic forms. Also there are going to be ways by which plants are going to convert them into inorganic forms or rather other living organisms or uh, physical processes are going to convert these nitrogen into nitrates and nitrites and then these forms are going to be absorbed by the plant using roots. Now this is a part of a very extensive nitrogen cycle that runs in our biosphere but right now you need to know that these nitrates and nitrites are one of the most common forms of nitrogen that are picked up by the plants. Now you might also remember about a special bacteria called rhizobium. Rhizobium is a unicellular bacteria which lives in the root nodules of leguminous plants which include peas, grams, beans, pulses etc. And this form of relationship where be the plant and the bacteria is living together and they are benefiting each other from their associ association is known as a symbiotic relationship. So because the rhizobium lives in the roots of the plants it converts the atmospheric nitrogen into usable forms which the plant can use to make its own proteins. In return, the plant is providing the bacteria with food and shelter. And in this particular sort of relationship, because both the bacteria and the plant is going to be beneficial for each other, therefore, this is an example of symbiotic relationship. Now, I'm just going to summarize heterotrophic mode of nutrition in plants. We have seen that plants show autotrophic mode of nutrition, but there are exceptions of plants which also show heterotrophic mode of nutrition. That is, they're going to synthesize their carbohydrates by photosynthesis, but as I have said, they're going to be dependent on insects for synthesis of their proteins. Then there are also plants which are parasitic, like amarbel or cascuta. So this picture is of pitcher plant. The pitcher plant has its leaf modified in this jug-like or pitcher-like manner which has a lid or an opening. Once an insect sits on in the structure, there are, hairs, there are hairs which are present inside the pitcher and those hairs are going to trap the insect and they are going to be digestive juices which are going to break down the insect so that it can be utilized in order to take nitrogen. This image is of cascuta. Cascuta, as you can see, the green climber which is just growing on this tree and has covered the tree entirely is cascuta and it is a parasitic plant.